Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 2, Episode 20, Freeverse, which means... We only have two episodes to go until the end of season two and only two more episodes to our 50th. And I know like in the grand scheme of things, 50 is not that many episodes, but I'm really, really looking forward to hitting a checkbox with 50 episodes. Yeah. The epi- yeah. And I'm actually getting excited about getting close to the Dick Wolf uh, law and order type vice. I know Melissa's chomping at I'm the bit dying. for us to I'm get dying. to <laughs> not just the season three, but to the finale of oh season two. Yes. Yes, I am. I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> the the episode originally premiered on April 4th, 1986. It was directed by John Nicolella, which I think, no, he will direct one more episode this season. Uh, Trust Fund Pirates, I think, is his episode as well. And then he will disappear because he's one of the showrunners that will leave d- when Dick Wolf takes over. So we are almost to the end of John Nicolella. We've had him. He's directed like eight episodes before this. I was going to say he's responsible for like 12 of the episodes we've watched. Yeah, so. exactly. I think he even wrote a couple under a pseudonym. So <laughs> <laughs> the writers are Jim Trombetta, who also wrote Tale of the Goat. He also wrote that amazing this episode from earlier this season. <laughs> and Shell Willens, who didn't write anything else for Miami Vice, but he did write an episode of Walker, Texas Ranger. Oh, that's promising. <laughs> that is promising. Yes. <laughs> That explains some of the scenes in this episode. Yes, it does. It does. <laughs> Before we get started, I can check in and scroll to each other's lives. And guys, this is an 80s podcast. So I'm going to ask you an 80s question because a certain 80s person is back. Being, he's big time. Kurt Russell is back. And I couldn't be happier that Kurt Russell is back being in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. But instead of spoiling that. Guardians, <laughs> because I think we're all gigantic fans of Guardians 2 and the amazing Kurt Russell as Ego in the film. I'm going to go through some movies and I'm going to make you guys choose a hard, out of a hard question here. What is your favorite Kurt Russell movie? No, I'm not doing it. You can't make me. <laughs> Escape from New York, The Thing, Big Trouble in Little China, Overboard, Tango and Cash, which we just watched, mm-hmm. Backdraft, yeah. Captain Ron, Tombstone, Stargate, Escape from L.A., 3,000 Miles to Graceland, uh, Death Proof. That, that, oh, um, that was a good movie. I love that movie. <laughs> and he's obviously in both Furious 7 and Furious 8, or Fate of the Furious, or the, the latest one. John, I'm going to make you choose. What's your go-to Kurt Russell movie? It, it's tough for me, especially like because we just watched Tango and Cash, which is an all-time favorite of mine. Grew up watching that with our father. That is like <laughs> one of my go-to Kurt Russell movies. I've probably seen it a hundred times. I do love Stargate because I'm a sci-fi fan. Yep. Um, yes. I don't know. I mean, I think, but I do love him in 3,000 Miles. Miles to Graceland. Yeah, because that is it fits Kurt Russell so much. That is him. <laughs> I was in person there. Well, I think I know what movie Melissa is going to pick. I I live by the Jack Burton rule of life. And therefore, <laughs> Big Trouble in a Little China is my is my Kurt Russell movie. Well, I'm curious to know what you think I'm going to pick. Oh, I know what you're going to pick. You're going to pick Backdraft. As your Kurt Russell movie. And you were close. Uh-huh. You're close. <laughs> you know, I can't. I'm a sucker for a Western. I love me some Tombstone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's hard to look past, uh-huh. especially because it's got Val Kilmer in uh-huh. it. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and what's funny about that, too, is that I didn't realize that his dad, Bing Russell, mm-hmm. was like a staple in Western TV shows and movies. And I didn't, never realized that that was Kurt Russell's in all of those Westerns I was watching <laughs> with him. It just blew me. And so it makes so much more sense that Kurt Russell always had that kind of cowboy ass with the cowboy boots. And yep. The last thing I'm going to say about Kurt Russell is Executive Decision is a very underrated movie uh, <laughs> in his catalog. Well, let's go talk about an episode that is the total opposite of Westerns, where they protect a poet. Yeah. That's the thing that really happened <laughs> yeah. in Miami Vice. Let's go talk about this episode. Well, fans, you heard that right. The premise of this episode is Miami Vice is going to protect a poet. And that's where we're going to start off this episode is at the airport. The ladies, the duo, Castillo, and the B-team are all at the airport waiting to pick up Benito Sandoval. He is coming in. He's flying in. He's a he's under witness protection because 
the leftist guerrillas. He's, he's a member of the leftist guerrillas, or he's kind of centric, but the right wings want to kill him. So we meet Sandoval, who is like this over the top womanizer character that's just like grabbing asses and lifting mm-hmm. up skirts all yeah. over the he's airport. He's a pervert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, even his daughter says at the beginning of the episode in the next few scenes about him being pervert and liking them young. <laughs> yeah. How she can't bring her friends around basically is what she says. <laughs> yeah. I do love the fact that the entire squad showed up to welcome them. I mean, they might as well have made a sign. Um, if they just checked the airport for the assassins this episode would have been over with at the open yeah because the both the assassins show up at the airport beyond uh the one assassin we never really find out everyone's names her name they call her la muerta we find out later in the episode it's bianca jagger who's playing mick jagger's at the time, his current wife. That was like several yes. wives ago, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is his ex-wife and I guess a a political activist. Um, she actually born in like Venezuela or somewhere, so, somewhere in South America. Like this, like this episode, we don't actually find out what country people are from. Uh, they're just from Central America, which is just one country. Um, so, but... Uh, uh, apparently, she studied in Paris, and she was a big political activist. In this scene, she walks in off of an airplane. She meets up with another man. We find out is the other assassin. They just like exchange a gun hand to hand in the middle of the airport, and then she pretends to be a reporter. Walks up and asks Sandoval a question. Who, by the way, in this whole episode, he's he's in a wheelchair. But she asks him a couple questions and goes back to the other assassin and says, "This man's going to be easy to kill." Yeah, and it, the Vice Squad. I mean, from the very beginning, not very low profile for protected witness. I mean, they well, just I push him think, right up to the press. And... I don't think they were supposed to be like low profile. He's like, it's big. It's a big deal that he was there, mm-hmm. and everyone knows he's like like a political. I don't know how to say that, like a political, he's like politically asylumed, basically. Mm -hmm. And so they were just protecting, everyone knew that he was going to come. Everyone knew he was going to show up. So they're just protecting him. They're just there so he doesn't get shot. (laughs) He wasn't supposed to be like secretly brought in. (laughs) My question to you is, what does this have to do with drugs and hookers? Yeah, I know. They talk about it in the beginning. Well, that's what that's where we're going to go next, because we go over to the safe house where they take Sandoval, which looks like a like one of those new mega churches. I don't know, but I don't understand why they pick these places. that are so like gigantic. Like, why don't you pick like an apartment somewhere in a crappy building or something? I don't know. know. (laughs) Why does every safe house have a dock? (laughs) <laughs> that seems like someone break extra... out a cheese plate <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that seems like that's an extra safety precaution that you shouldn't have to take right someone yeah. could come up by boat in the middle of the night and just steal your person you're protecting although when they were in, like in glades where they're in the crappy part of miami uh in the crap part of miami he just walked right out the front door so it's not like they True. do any better with the crappy small hey, places but that either. was when they were going to the bathroom or something. The B team had to... <laughs> they were talking about their mustard oh, sandwiches right. yeah, and going to right. the bathroom. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 yeah. <laughs> but Tubbs asks this exact question. He comes pulling up to the house, gets out of his car. Zito comes and meets him at the gate. And Tubbs asks, why are we doing this? Why is Vice being witness protection, which we know they are terrible at, well, or apparently diplomat. you don't know that, but they're good at it because he says, <laughs> because we're so good at this and we're so, in- in- I can't say that word, inconspicuous. I can't say it. <laughs> he also says that they're so efficient. Yeah, efficient. In- in- yeah. History shows the vice team is terrible at witness protection. <laughs> yeah. Yes. They would have been and better off good. just shooting him at the beginning of the episode <laughs> and just getting it over with. <laughs> Hey, by the end of the episode, I would have been happy if they had. So <laughs> We find out at the safe house, too, Sandoval goes into this long explanation. He's so long-winded throughout the whole episode. He says that he was a poet. He was arrested. He was then sent into house arrest where he wrote this political book. And now he's like in political asylum in the, in the United States. He's going to testify at Congress for... Who knows what? Because we he's, never actually find he's, out. What he's testifying is about like what what atrocities are happening in their in their country. That's mm-hmm. what he's supposed to be testifying. He's, like people not having food. And when she, the, the daughter talks about how there's no mo- no one has any money, no one has any food. We know the country of Central America has a history <laughs> of poverty. Yeah, I like um, how when they so, show later on, they show a flag of it, and it's like we just waves in the wind. You just can't blue see it. And it's black. like blue and black. Like, is that supposed to be a real flag? Like I don't know. <laughs> Keep blowing the wind so no one can get a good eye on it. <laughs> we also find out that's when Blanca, his daughter, 
says that he's in he's a womanizer he she can't bring her friends around and he also says he wants to go out and do some nightlife stuff castillo wants to shut him down but eventually he caves in and let him go to these two awards banquets while he's in town which is totally unlike castillo i can't believe that this was ever yeah, Ca- approved yeah i know castillo is like totally like you're grounded now roll to your room um, <laughs> and and he's totally acting like a teenage girl like you can't make me you're not my dad and he just caves i do enjoy tubbs's conversation with the daughter when she's telling him about how creepy her dad is and tubbs like yeah he's a pervert i got it but how are you doing <laughs> yeah, we get how he is, but how are you? How do you fit into this? When we leave from the safe house, we go over to the, the Central American embassy. That's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> question mark? <laughs> the man and the woman, the assassins, La Muerta and the whatever. They say what 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 the other guy's name is, but it doesn't matter because the the couple times he gets to talk a couple times and he gets shot in the face. So that's the end <laughs> of him. <laughs> we see those two talking. They're talking to a diplomat at the embassy. And the, the diplomat is saying, this is it. This is all that we're going to give you. We're cutting you off. You guys are on your own. And there's a little exchange between those two. But they're literally taking a cache, a weapons cache, enough for a freaking army. Yeah, loads and loads of guns. This is all, though. You don't get any more after this. <laughs> you don't eat all your dinner. You don't get this, any dessert. <laughs> this, this whole scene just boils down to let's talk very dramatically with bad accents. <laughs> A lot of eyebrows, though, too. They were going up and down yes. and up and down. Outside of the embassy, there's another man, nicely dressed man. You find out later his name is Manuel. He's watching. I don't know what he's seeing. He's so creepy. Well, what is he seeing? There's a fence around the compound, too. He's seeing the wall, the <laughs> flags. He, he watches <laughs> the limos leave, and then he gets in his Porsche, and he drives away. Like this, That's all that we see of Manuel at this point. We go back to the safe house, and Blanca and Sandoval, so father and daughter, are having an argument outside. Their arguments throughout the entire episode are pretty petty. They're not really... They don't seem like they're really that influential into what's happening in the episode, because I kept waiting for there to be, like, Blanca Blanca so deep with the leftists that she actually wants her father to be killed too or something like that. But it never works out that way. Yeah, I, I thought that the first time I watched the episode, I thought like, oh, she's involved in it. That's where it's going to come out. But then when they kidnapped her, I'm like, oh, okay, I guess that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> I was wrong on that one. <laughs> yeah, Pr- pretty much all their arguments are you're drunk, dad. <laughs> Go to bed. Zito and Tubbs come down because there's like no Crockett in this episode, by the way. He's only in like a handful of times. Just, to, just when someone needs to die. Crockett, Crockett's on scene. I like how he's only there for like the serious scoldings. Like when someone's got to be scolded really seriously, he's there to tell them, listen, lady, we don't have time for your banana tactics. <laughs> we got to get out of here. <laughs> but he, Tubbs and Zito come down to say, you guys are in plain sight. You guys should go inside or at least Sandoval <laughs> should go inside so he doesn't get shot. Sandoval goes inside and Tubbs turns to Blanca and it's like, hey, how you doing, girl? <laughs> <laughs> he makes a pass at her, and Blanc also explains again about pe- making pass at her girlfriends that her dad's just an angry pervert all the Pretty time. Much. Yeah. And Blanc, and then Tubbs asks a really important question. He says, "Well, then why do you hang out with him? What what do you get out of this?" Melissa, you were trying to explain to me that there's that she gets something, but I still don't see it. I still don't see what she benefits out of this. Well, what she was saying is that she's a writer. I think what she was trying to say is she got her writing career from her dad because she writes for some magazine. That is like a, I don't know what she said, like a gorilla she's, she's magazine? She's an editor for a newspaper, a like newspaper. a leftist oh, okay. newspaper. newspaper. So she gets that, and but because she writes for that leftist newspaper, she has people that want to kill her. So in order to be protected, she basically hangs out with her dad because he's got protection. Mm. Okay. He's got okay. people that are protecting him so they can't get to her if she's with him, is the way I understood what she was saying. In Trump's America, they would just deport her ass. <laughs> well, in Trump's America, they wouldn't bring him over here. They don't care what he's saying. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, we're going off, though. We gotta... <laughs> Later that night, the whole Vice team is dressed very nice. They're going to take Sandoval out to a poetry jam. Is that where they're taking him? <laughs> no, they're going to like an art museum, right? What the heck? I want to discuss. When we get the, to this scene. I need to discuss what the hell is Tubbs wearing? <laughs> Why is he wearing like a tuxedo with like a short jacket and it's like shiny? And it's like he like extra styled his hair. It's like he put extra stuff in there or something. He's going to be around the rich people. Melissa. I guess. Yeah. I guess like, it's maybe like, he can hang up his vice shoes. But he looked like a waiter. <laughs> No, no one could top Zito, though. Zito looked like he was like in the 70s going to his prom. 
<laughs> He's wearing that blue <laughs> tuxedo. They get in Tubbs' car, and Tubbs tells Sandoval to lay down. That way he doesn't get shot. Sorry, and, Sorry. And put s- this blanket over your head. <laughs> <laughs> you can't know where we're going. <laughs> and this is at about the point in time for me, because I've never seen this episode. Where, oh, my God. I just hope they shoot Sandoval already. I just kill you. this bastard. <laughs> <laughs> You leave Tubbs alone. He didn't do anything wrong. He's just trying to protect you. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Especially when we get over to the gala, which is where we're going now. And Tubbs tries to take the blanket off and he slaps Tubbs' hand. Like, you mother... Yeah. (laughs) You leave him alone. (laughs) (laughs) I might as well get it out of the way now. Hector Sandoval, played by Bjorn Piven or Bernard Piven, I guess is is his actual name. Bernard Piven being Jeremy Piven's dad. Uh, You might remember him as the riverboat captain in the Uncle Ben's rice commercials. (laughs) Um, Oh, that was him? (laughs) That was him. (laughs) Damn, I wish I always wondered who that was. (laughs) So he also, he's actually been in... (laughs) Was he also Mr. Belvedere? (laughs) No, dude, but he was also in Miracle on 34th Street, and I thought, well, that makes sense. He was Santa. No, he wasn't Santa, so... But he was also in uh, Being John Malkovich, Pirates with Kira Sedgwick. He did TV spots on the A-Team. So him and his wife created the Piven Theater Workshop. And some of their most famous students are John Joan and Anne Cusack and Rosanna Arquette. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, he is also the father-in-law to a man named Adam McKay. And you may not know who that is, but he is an SNL writer and co-founder of Funny or Die. Basically co-writes everything Will Ferrell has ever done. I was going to say, he's got a, he has something with Will Ferrell then gotcha. because he's connected to all that stuff you just mentioned. <laughs> yes, yeah, they're basically partners in comedy. When we get to all this All the gal- rice you can eat. <laughs> I want to know if he still had that riverboat, though. <laughs> did, he get, did he get to keep it? No. <laughs> When we get to the gala, Sandoval comes into a standing ovation, and it's just a bunch of art snobs. This whole episode, I'm like, God, just someone kill Sandoval already. <laughs> it's like an art party at this museum. He's grabbing asses. Yeah, he's like and going around looking at everyone's ass and like just going around caressing just, women's hands yeah, and like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Both of the assassins are there to La Muerta and whatever the other guy's name is, and then Manuel shows up too, and him and Blanca both know each other she walks over to him they hug and then they leave together and they're just gone for the rest of the party so i guess like there's she doesn't really care that much about her dad maybe like just she hadn't seen him in three years she said mm. so that she was she was very excited to see him <laughs> she was like oh i haven't seen you in three years it's been so long and then she just took off eventually sandoval does sit down with the female assassin and he's like caressing her hands and she's like Telling him, like, yeah, I'm totally into you, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then she says, it's time for you to disappear. And Tubbs, he, he's watching from across the... Because the, they're not very good at this protection thing. You'd think they'd be close by, but no, they're like 40 or 50 feet away. Because they keep trying to be close to him, and he keeps telling them to leave. And, like, remember he's telling them to leave? He only wants the women, first mm-hmm. of all. He only wanted it, Trudy... And Gina to protect him because of their women. And then he's like, whatever. And he's like, and Tubbs told him in the beginning, like, stay close to us. And he just like wheels away. <laughs> like, Screw you. No. So Tubbs recognizes Muerta and he comes over and just in time as she stands up, says, you need to disappear and pulls her gun out. Tubbs pulls his gun out, shoots her three times and she drops dead. Well, technically in her acting ability, she drops dead before Tubbs fires the gun. It was like a phantom shot. And then she's like, <laughs> makes a face like she got shot already. And then she's like, Ugh, and falls down. <laughs> <laughs> that was exactly how it happened, by the way. <laughs> I just reenacted it We're for so you. so terrible, Mick Jagger cheated on her and divorced her. <laughs> Ouch. Sandoval is visibly upset about it. My thought was that he was upset that he wasn't going to get to have sex that night. He thought for sure that she was <laughs> she was going for it, and then she was dead. He was like, damn, I, was, I spent all that time on her. <laughs> yeah, it, It's weird, because the next scene starts out, and they're back at the safe house, and he's basically telling them he wants a gun, almost like he doesn't trust Tubbs for saving his life. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and- the one time Tubbs saved somebody, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are always talking about how he doesn't protect anyone. He did that time. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, no well, respect. <laughs> and Crockett tells Sandoval, why don't you write some poems about the ocean and let us do the police work? <laughs> Sorry. Crockett's like a jerk in this whole episode. I mean, I get it, like, why yes. he's a jerk, but he pretty much is a jerk this whole episode. He just shows up and, like, <laughs> tells much. people, like, are you sure you can handle this? Like, well, then where the hell have you been, Crockett, with your alligator? Like, yeah, what's I, the deal? I, I actually, that, that exact phrase when he says that later, I actually wrote, dick move, Crockett. Dick yeah, he's move. like, are you sure you guys are okay? <laughs> There's some hubbub at the door, and then we find out that Manuel has showed up at the safe house. Manuel and Blanca have shown up at the safe house. Because she stayed out all night with him. Mm -hmm. Uh Mm Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And Tubbs is (laughs) like, hey, that wasn't... So we find out that Manuel was... He's a student of Sandoval. They go out on the back patio and have a very awkward conversation. And then Tubbs and Blanca talk inside, and he's like, hey, Blanca, that was a dick move that you stayed out all night. And she's like, well, I mean... Yeah. I know that was bad, but you want to bang? <laughs> yeah, what are, you, are you worried? No, she said, yeah. are you worried about this because for professional or for like basically like personal use? He's like, well, I can't date you right now because, you know, I, I have like a standard. Well, and- I love she comes in and he and he says like, not cool, not cool. Yeah, I know. And then, she brings cool. up, and then she brings up, you want some casual sex, you know, and, and you can tell like Tubbs says. like... <laughs> That's actually what she says, yeah. And and yeah. Tubbs almost reacts like, yeah, but it'll be sweaty, so. <laughs> I have to warn you, it will be sweaty, and my feet will go in the air. <laughs> yes. Well, you also see that when Blanca shows up with Manuel, you can see the look in Tubbs' eye, that jealousy look in Tubbs' eyes, right? Yeah, because, you know, it, it's not a case for Miami Vice unless someone tries to bone somebody in the case. <laughs> Crockett has done it Rocket. a couple times. You know, Tubbs has done it. We haven't seen you guys haven't seen it, but it will happen where the girls do it. So mm. it does happen with the girls. It's the only person it d- the people it doesn't happen with is Zito and Zwitek because no one wants to bone them. So, <laughs> 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 so except for each other, maybe. That's, I mean, I guess maybe yeah. I don't know. There's somebody out there, but <laughs> they couldn't get anyone. <laughs> I, I just love how everyone is bait to Crockett. He's like, maybe we should send him out there as bait. And you know, I'm thinking in my head like. Aren't Pirates trying to kill you, Sonny? Like, no, because that didn't happen, apparently. Let, let, let's focus on protecting him first. <laughs> well, next we head to a hotel, high end hotel, high end bar. You know it's a high end bar because a woman in a very slim bikini is walking yeah. her gigantic dog through the bar. I was like, what the hell is going on? Is this a bar or like a bikini contest? What is going on? We see that the ladies, they are monitoring Manuel, but they are monitoring him from like the roof. <laughs> I was like, why are they like a mile away? Like, really? Why were they so far away? They could have been in the bar. I don't even think he saw them. He never saw them at the house. No. No, so, he doesn't even know who they are. Like they could have just been down there, but instead they're on like the seventy third floor of the hotel. <laughs> <watching>. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they know that they're not very good at surveillance, and so they're like, "We got to stay far away." He'll ca- he'll catch on right away that we're caught. Well, who knows why they would put the women's the ladies' restroom in the seventh floor? But, <laughs> yeah, I know. You know. <laughs> well, of course, the other assassin and his cronies show up, grab Manuel fire off a couple shots at the ladies up on the 14th floor and then get away scot-free because the ladies like announce their police from like 40 miles away (laughs) and they're like hey police and then yeah it starts it basically starts a shootout and then they don't get any shots off because they're too far away yeah yeah police stay where you are while we take the elevator (laughs) i do want to point out yeah I do want to point out that our most famous guest stars are probably these goons I say probably because we don't get a very good look at them. We don't know if they were actually the goons. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, all I know is that in the episode notes, it lists them as goons. And I'm assuming this is what they meant because I couldn't spot them in any other part of the show. The goons being Luis Guzman, who w- whose movies include Out of Sight, Traffic, Boogie Nights, Snake Eyes, Bone Collector, Magnolia, Punch Junk club waiting keanu actually a list of movies that i about every six months <laughs> he was already in an episode of ice too 
This is his second appearance in Vice. I thought he was in mm-hmm. the, he's not in more than two. He's only in two episodes. He might. I don't know if he's in more, but he was definitely already in one. Yeah, he was in one. Yeah, he was in the one where oh. they go to with um. He's in the one with Glenn Fry. Oh, he's in okay. The, yeah. He's the guy that survives the the Vice attack on the airplane that's stuck in the swamp. <laughs> Gotcha. Okay. It, it's hard to keep. It's hard to keep track of them because they keep playing different characters. So <laughs> you know, if there were one consistent character, you could, you could be like, yeah, that was him. But hey, you know what? They oh. spent their budget on cars. Okay, cars and boats. They don't have time for uh, people and shellacked <laughs> shiny suits. Yeah, they don't have so, time. They don't have the money for people. They're like, you want to come back and play the same a different guy? Sure, whatever. <laughs> Our other goons are Marta Valesco, who was in the movie The Bodyguard with Houston and a couple other crappy movies. And then <laughs> Michael Bay, incredible director of Bad Boys 1 and 2, the entire Transformers series, Armageddon, The Rock, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, and it's interesting side notes about Michael Bay. He began his career as a production assistant on Night Court. <laughs> yes i got the night theme song was, in my head right now <laughs> he interned for george lucas when he was 15 while they were put it, while they were filming raiders of the lost ark he has stated that he thought was going to be terrible but turns out <laughs> it was actually pretty good <laughs> he also directed music videos for meatloaf tina turner and lionel richie which is what got him uh, noticed by Jerry Brockheimer, who eventually helped him direct the movies that I just listed. You know what I can appreciate about Michael Bay is when something blows up, he's really going to blow that shit up. Like, <laughs> you want that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we need a shot of a building blowing up. Someone get me some C4. Yeah, <laughs> We're exactly. going to blow this we thing up. We are going to blow it up good. <laughs> what happens after Manuel gets kidnapped? We have a brief stop over at the precinct where Castillo says they're, they're, this is the last event that Sandoval is going to. We're also moving safe houses, but we're going to keep people at the original safe house in case the assassins show up there. Crockett asked about what about Manuel? He's, he's and, gone. And, yeah, Castillo's he's like, like, he's gone, gone whatever. <laughs> he's like, he's gone. We can't find him. <laughs> we're not that worried about it. And, and then Crockett's like, aren't you worried he's going to get because he's going to be tortured? He's going to give up the location of the safe house. And then that's when they talk about we're going to move safe houses. And, so and that's th- when Crockett makes the comment. To the girls, like, are you sure you're up to it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, uh, not to sound, not to be a spoiler and not to sound like a naysayer, but they really didn't handle it because <laughs> stuff went bad on both ends at the safe, at the first safe house and the second safe house, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Then we go to Sandoval's last appearance at this school where, he, and, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here, other than it goes on and on and on with him reading some dumbass poem and then seeing the worst no, no, part of this happens. detail is listening to his poetry yeah i love how Tubbs looks like un, he's so unimpressed and crockett's like not paying attention he's like telling people to get out of here get the hell out of here with that i don't know what the guy had in a bag he's like get the hell out of here with that bag <laughs> for those initiated it, 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 it was like listening to vogon poetry <laughs> <laughs> if, if cell phones existed, they both would have been texting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. And then we go to, well, we, right when we go to the school, Zito makes a phone call and he finds out that they found the car that Gina and Trudy had seen that had kidnapped Manuel. So Switek and Zito are going to go with a police detail and go bust in and go save Manuel. So that's where we go next. It's like an abandoned church almost. I don't know. I couldn't figure out what the hell that was. It looked like a church or a school. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe a school. I I don't know, but what are they going to do with that banana? (laughs) Get nervous. Well, that's what that's what I wrote down here. (laughs) The inside Mexican (laughs) Billy Ray Cyrus is put he's gonna murder. He's gonna murder (laughs) Manuel. Here's the process that he goes through. Here's here's the process to killing someone from Mexican Billy Ray Cyrus. He puts head he puts headphones on himself. He then puts a bag over the person's head and takes their pants off. Then he turns <laughs> turns on music and then eats a banana. <laughs> um, you forgot See, the most. I wasn't expecting part. to eat the banana. I thought the banana was the banana was going somewhere very wrong. Yeah, I was like, "This is banana, about to get real." When they showed the banana on top of the stereo, I was like, "What the yeah. hell?" So, so step one in this game: put a bag over the person's head. Step two: pull their pants off, leave them in their underwear. Put no, you got to put those g-string underwear on them. There's no way that that guy had those zebra print zebra underwear, print, <laughs> jockey underwear. So they find you when you're dead. They find you wearing 
wearing these horribly embarrassing underwear <laughs> and a banana peel. Step, but mystery I, I, is, where did the banana God. go? <laughs> <laughs> I, I swear to God, I pulled his pants down and they reached for the banana. I was like, this is about to get real. <laughs> <laughs> Step three. <laughs> they don't mess around a- in Central America. <laughs> <laughs> Step three, get a boom box and hang the speakers from the boom box next to the person's head. Yes. Step four, turn the music on really loud. Step five, eat a banana. Yeah. <laughs> That's just how this goes. <laughs> also, can can someone explain to me like why where was like the ring of blood like around his head? What is that from? Were they beating him up? They must have beat him up before. Or they hit something? him with that banana. <laughs> 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 Beat with a banana. <laughs> <laughs> this goes relatively normal. Like the team comes in, they there's no gunfire or anything. They save Man- Manuel. They arrest Billy Ray Cyrus at the scene, and so we go to the hospital next. Where the duo shows up to come talk to B- Manuel. Manuel says that the person who captured him is Alfredo Gomez, which who I think is the other assassin, is the male assassin. That's his name, not Billy Ray Cyrus. Not Billy Ray Cyrus. It's the other guy. He doesn't know where they went. He doesn't know anything he doesn't about know where, where they were going. He doesn't, he doesn't know, know anything about any bananas. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not talk about the banana guys <laughs> <laughs> most of the vice squad is here at the hospital which is why it's you know so surprising that the person they were trying to protect gets away they get a <laughs> phone call and he's gone they don't know what happened I, I, I guess everyone shouldn't have gone to the hospital someone should have probably stayed with them <laughs> yeah sandoval was able to escape from I where they do it moved because he's him. in a wheelchair and i'm like all i want to do is like he gave him the slip <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> Wheel <laughs> Yeah, so they find out before they leave that they've lost Sandoval, but also want to point out that in the hospital room, Crockett, to his credit, he doesn't believe Manuel. He point he says outright. He thinks he's working with the leftist gorillas, and that's where all of his money's going. Crockett is skeptical. And then he goes to leave, and he says, "There's, we don't have enough time for your banana politics. Like, what is with the bananas in this episode? <laughs> what does that even mean? Like, really, what did that mean? Like, now I want to know. That's like some deep cut. I don't know. So next we cut to intermission. We have uh, Suicidal Tendencies show going on. Uh, Sandoval's Grandpa's, there. Mm-hmm. Grandpa's, Grandpa's going crazy. <laughs> Yeah, because Grandpa <laughs> likes to party, which is funny because this is probably the safest he's been all episode. <laughs> yeah, a suicidal True. tendencies show. Exactly. <laughs> and that suicidal tendencies performing for real yep, on stage, him. too. For reals, reals. And we're working <laughs> them in the music. Oh, I know. I'm sure that's, I'm sure they're pretty uh, <laughs> interesting. Sandoval's getting down. He's dancing. Yeah. He's feeling up ladies. He's getting super drunk. At the precinct, we see that Tubbs gets a phone call from a cabbie who says that he just got, he just dropped off someone, a real douchebag at uh, the club <laughs> Miami Springs. And so there he brings the ladies with him. He's, he brings ladies with him, but then he shows up with just Crockett. So I don't know what happens there. In the club, though, Sandoval they, they, is just. They were just sharing a cab. <laughs> At the club, Sandoval is out of control. He's he's totally out of control. A woman recognizes him. They go dance, but then a man grabs a woman that goes back to the table. He rams the man from behind in his wheelchair, then pulls his gun out and fires it into the air. He is totally out of control. He's too out of control for that that club that has suicidal tendencies playing. And a man wearing spiked shoulder pads as who's the bartender. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He's too crazy for that. Grandpa in his wheelchair shooting a gun in the air was too much. He then yeah. goes outside and drunkily paces around singing and then fires a shot at the streetlight. He's not pacing. No, I'm saying. Yeah, he's shooting at random stuff. He's he's in pain, mental anguish or yeah. something. Oh, I, I thought for a second there, I was like, is he going to shoot himself? Was this whole episode pointless? Mm-hmm. It's another suicide, but Crockett's not there to witness it, though, so it can't be true. <laughs> he actually shows up, so yeah, it was close. Exactly. Oh, yeah, and he goes totally the drunk route where he goes from really happy singing and dancing to depressed, Melancholy. crying. <laughs> yeah, the, and they have to, because what happens is he fires, he shoots at the streetlight. Tubbs and Crockett grab the gun from him, and then they start talking, and he goes from, hey, I'm having a great time in Miami to I'm so depressed, and I haven't written anything in years. Woe yeah, I think me. that what the thing is that set him off is that he read that poem at the school or whatever, and everyone clapped, but he said that was a really old poem he had written that, written that like years ago. Yeah, he hasn't written anything himself in years. No. Get the commercial. <laughs> 
Back at the hospital, Blanca gets a call at the room saying her father's downstairs. He took a cab. He's super drunk. And that she needs to come down and talk to him. And as she heads down, the assassin, Gomez, gets into the elevator with her. So we know, okay, they're going to... I figured they're going to kill her to get to him. But instead, they just take her captive. uh, Alfredo Gomez, by the way, played by Jamie Torelli, who essentially has been... He just kind of hung out with other Vice guest stars. He was in Carlito's Way with Guzman and John Leguizamo and Vigo Mortensen. He was in Big with John Hurd and Ford Apache, The Bronx with Pam Greer. State of Grace with John Turturro and Tom Waits. So he pretty much just, just sponged off of every single Vice. I shouldn't say sponged. I guess the Vice guest stars, you know, maybe they had a support group. They have their and own union. To do movies yeah. together. Miami Vice supporting actor union. Yeah. <laughs> yes. They have a special contract with Michael Mann. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so now we're coming up to the last two scenes of the episode. At the precinct, the duo brings Sandoval in and they go into dad's office and dad tells them, hey, Manuel, he's actually a highly skilled assassin that works for the leftist guerrillas. And so it all boils down to that Sonny was right. He was 100% right about Manuel and that they should have been monitoring him. But now Blanca has been taken prisoner and Manuel has escaped and no one knows what the hell is going on at the hospital. Why are you so surprised yeah, that so- he knew what he was talking about? <laughs> like, Rocket knows things. Because like he really he's does. not in the episode. Yeah, I know. He's not in the episode, though. But what does he know about anything? thing he only showed up to watch poetry yeah but he only showed up because he's like what they're trying to say is it went bad and things were bad because crockett wasn't there Uh, like oh but now mm -hmm. you got the head cop in here that's only when the b team's in charge you leave the b so essentially (laughs) essentially we learned that his own people are trying to kill him yeah yeah. it's like a double cross yeah both of them are trying to kill him the right wing want to kill him because he's a pain in the ass the left wing want to kill him to make him a martyr. Yep, exactly. And Sandoval gets a call from Gomez, says that we have your daughter come meet us at the beach, which is an evil thing to do for someone <laughs> in a wheelchair. Yeah. <laughs> come Dude, meet it, us on the beach. So, so, so they call the police station and say, we've got your daughter. Don't bring any cops. And it's like, why did you <laughs> call really the police station? I don't understand that part either. Like, how did they find him? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> why did you call the police station and say no cops? So, uh, and, and I mean. So the meat setup. Sandoval says, like, I'm just going to go sacrifice myself. Old for young, you guys can't go. And Crockett says, No, there's another way we can rescue her. And we're all like, No, you can't. The vice team can't. He says that that's what they do. He's like, This is what we do. This is why we're here. Well, we get people killed. That's ouch, what we do. Crockett, I hate to break it to you, but you're not that good at it. You're just not that good. Maybe you should like- I don't know. I don't know. It kind of fits in their wheelhouse. They murdered an entire town in boonies one time. <laughs> okay, I think you guys just need to get over that whole No, Everglades. we're never going to get over the Glades episode. They murdered an entire town. That whole town no needed to go, all right? It needed to go. <laughs> Except for that weird <laughs> looking kid, <laughs> but no. <laughs> There's an entire dead town with a drug play just sitting out in the Everglades. You know, they didn't murder that old man with his old gun. Obviously, <laughs> Luis Guzman hasn't forgot because he's on a new gang still trying to get <laughs> yeah, at, the, at the vice. Still. <laughs> 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 so the meet's set up now. Sandoval's going to go meet them. The vice team is going to bring them down. They get to play with all their new toys. The duo sitting out on the beach in a brand new Jeep using yeah. their night vision goggles. <laughs> no, which, <laughs> why haven't they used that before? Because they go to the beach all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Sandoval. Just and, look at the... and then he meets up with like a soccer mom with an Uzi. I don't know what that was. So, yeah, I don't know what the deal is with that. Like why that first person is there. But they, she, he grabs her sandoval grabs her and throws her on the ground and then the vice team shoots and kills her which obviously causes a shootout between the gang and the police and this happens really really fast the shootout happens obviously gomez said if you don't if you become the cops we're going to kill your daughter so he comes marching over to grab not on the inside and sandoval is in there too sandoval says hey i'm here let's do this like you can kill me, just spare my daughter. And then the vice team shoots and kills the entire gang. Like, it's, it's like, bam, bam, bam. It just all happens real fast. How did he get in there <laughs> so quickly? <laughs> One minute, he is on the beach, and he jumps out of the wheelchair and tackles the girl. Which, by the way, I love Sonny and Rico's reaction. Like, at first, like, he falls out of the wheelchair. And Crockett's almost like, ah, oh, crap, he fell. You need to go get him. And it's like, oh, no, something's going on. <laughs> Lights come on. And then... Next thing you know, he's inside the hotel 
And it's like, I, I just, how do you get in there that quick? <laughs> and then the vice squad just appears in the doorway. And dude, it's like, like they're expecting someone to take their picture. There's like eight of them <laughs> in the doorway, all like with their guns out, like shooting all the bad guys. <laughs> well, it's, it's, um, that's how they stand in their barbershop quartet. <laughs> <laughs> I said that too. I go, how did they not see them there? All of a sudden they just magically appeared. In this, and it was like the biggest doorway you'd ever seen. You could drive like a car through that doorway. And there's like 10 of them. Yeah. This all there then, with guns. And then you think it's all over and Sam Sandoval somehow immediately outside with his daughter now, and they're all well, Tubbs, talking. Tubbs and- tells them he's like, "They he, Blanca survives." Sandoval's there. They hug, and Tubbs looks at him and goes like, "Maybe you guys should go outside." Like he's still under witness protection. Like why you? He yeah. was almost assassinated. Just why don't you guys just go frolic on the beach for a while? Yeah, like, I mean, and without any police and protection. Guerrero's gone, <laughs> and so you yeah. don't know where he's at. He left the hospital, so uh, <laughs> maybe you should still protect him. <laughs> But we need to have yeah. Manuel show up again because we need to make sure this whole storyline is wrapped up. Yeah, of course. So they're outside talking and the boyfriend shows up. Surprise, he's going to kill Sandoval and uh, I guess his girlfriend too for some reason. <laughs> um, he says he and then once though. again, <laughs> the entire vice squad just appears in the doorway and everyone just l- loads into uh, Manuel. You know? uh, it, it's like, how many times can they just appear like that and just, <laughs> just waste them? <laughs> Luckily they did because but now I guess this the entire story- storyline is done everyone all the assassins have been killed everything's wrapped up and sandoval's gonna go testify we don't have to hear from any of these people again <laughs> <laughs> yep yeah, moral of the story is now you can testify about poetry <laughs> this is it that's the end it, yep, it, that's it freeze frames and the episode's over this episode was to- i was the name of the episode is free verse i should have seen this coming that it was either music or some or some sort of art related but never in my wildest dreams i think we would have an episode of miami vice where they protect where they're doing witness protection and escort for a poet uh-huh <laughs> and not even a good poet by the way yeah well let's I go over to where she's from <laughs> it's a mystery that'll never be solved. <laughs> well, let's go over and talk about the music because I'm excited to hear about suicidal tendencies. All right, John. I did a quick peek at the music. Obviously, Suicidal Tendencies was performing live. So what you got for me this week? All right. So believe it or not, Suicidal Tendencies, mildly interesting. The other two, meh. So uh, <laughs> let, let, let's start with the Canadian side of music, where we have the first, the first song, Feel It Again, by Honeymoon Suite, a Canadian <laughs> hard rock band. Feel it again in the honeymoon suite. <laughs> Feel it again by the band Honeymoon Suite. So they are a Canadian band formed in 1981 in Niagara Falls, which I guess is why they call themselves Honeymoon Suite because people get married there. <laughs> None of this math is adding up, John. Canadian rock band from Niagara Falls. This doesn't add up. <laughs> no, no not, not, not really. Uh, no. They were led by uh, singer and guitarist Johnny D, with the only other mainstay member being Daryl Grehan. And the reason I say that is the damn members change so frequently, I didn't bother to write it down. <laughs> um, so just know it's Johnny D's band. They, they won an unsigned band contest by a Toronto radio station, Q107, uh, <laughs> with the song New Girl Now. Uh, 84 self titled debut album scored four hits in Canada, with New Girl Now reaching the top 50 in the, uh, in the United States. So the song they won the radio contest with was actually their first top 50 hit. On their second album, The Big Prize reached the top 40 as well. Nine, they had another song featured in the Vice series finale. They actually had three songs in uh, Miami Vice total. Mm. And I am not looking forward to their <laughs> next two music segments because they're rather manila. Um, I mean, literally, they like, are like, this is the stuff I have. <laughs> Yes, this is stuff I have to talk about. Other movies that feature their songs are The Wraith with Charlie Sheen and Kinda Interesting 
1987, D was temporarily replaced by Michael McDonald while D recovers from a broken leg after being hit by a car in LAX. So that album must have been their only good album. Yeah, Michael McDonald. <laughs> I'm like, damn. He just replaced them in touring uh, oh. D, while D was recovering from a broken leg. So like, that's that's the interesting fact. He got hit by a car once and Michael <laughs> McDonald had to come in and sing for him for a few weeks. A better singer came in. <laughs> yes. Yes. I can jam to some Michael McDonald, though. I that. like Michael McDonald. <laughs> like... The rest of their albums were successful in Canada, but not really in the U.S. If you want a good laugh, look them up just to look at a picture of them because they are a Canadian <laughs> hair band. <laughs> so you want just, to look at just someone funny looking. Imagine people. people. <laughs> just imagine like in the 80s, like with like the big hair metal bands. Just imagine what a Canadian hair band looks like. <laughs> The next song in the episode was the Suicidal Seas, but I'm going to skip over and we're going to come back to them because we're going to talk about the other Canadian singer, the song Maybe the Poet by Bruce Cockburn. He's a singer-songwriter whose music is kind of folky, jazz, rock. Basically, he's the Canadian James Taylor. What is with the Canadians in Miami Vice? Are they like the non-union equivalent? <laughs> <laughs> I guess American, so. But they're too expensive. <laughs> uh, I, I swear to God. He, he, he's like the Canadian James Taylor. He's written over 300 songs. He has over 30 albums. He's sold close to a million records in Canada alone, which I guess is important to some people. That's like two <laughs> per house. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he attended the Berkeley School of Music in Boston for three semesters in 64 before joining the band The Children in 66. That only lasted a year. Let's see. He played in a handful of bands after that, including a band called Olivia's, which opened for Jimi Hendrix and Cream in 68. So, And then he went solo from 69 on, and he's just been solo. He released his first solo album in 1970 called Going to the Country. Had more of a Christian theme to it. He didn't really become popular in the U.S. until 79, when his album Dancing in the Dragon's Jaws came out with the song Wondering Where the Lions Are, reaching number 21 on the Hot 100. He just can't get his animals even... straight. <laughs> exactly. You know, and it even got him an appearance on SNL in 1980, which his music in the 80s and 90s got a lot more political. The reason they chose him for this episode is he actually did a song about a event that happened in Guatemala where rebels were bombed and real carnivores. It's one of, like, one of his songs so but i didn't want to get in too much about the politics side stuff in 91 intrepid records actually released a tribute album called kick at the darkness which featured a bunch of different bands covering his songs and it included a cover of the song lovers in a dangerous time which was covered by the bare naked ladies which apparently was one of the things that helped propel them into success because it was actually their first top 40 hit so a cover of a cover. Yes. The Bare Naked <laughs> Ladies. No, the, not uh, le, le, let me correct. The Bare Naked Ladies covered a Bruce Cockburn song. Ah, uh, gotcha. A Bruce Cockburn tribute album, which was their first top 40 hit, which is why we have the Bare Naked Ladies now. Gotcha. Well, great. Um, That's why. <laughs> yes. It figures that the Bare Naked Ladies were responsible by a Canadian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I got much more into the political side of stuff, and he won a bunch of awards. Like I said, he, he had a, he's had a career that spanned over 40 years, but just not a lot, lot of interesting, at least as far as my segment's concerned. <laughs> so now let's turn to Suicidal Tendency song, Institutionalized. The exact opposite of Canadians. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, the exact Literally, opposite. There's so. an entire country between... <laughs> the first Canadian artists in yes. suicidal tendencies, considering that they are yeah, the so. first real Hispanic, like not real, but real popular Hispanic yeah. rock group. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're actually a, a uh, an American thrash band founded in Venice, California in 1980. They were founded by vocalist Mike Muir, who is only remaining original member in the band. So similar to the first Canadian group, Suicidal Tendencies has had 34 past and current members. Damn. Wow. Mike Muir is the only one that's been in the band the entire length 
depth of it. But yeah, 34 different people. So the current lineup features Mir on vocals, guitarists Dean Pleasance and Jeff Pogan, bassist Raw Diaz, and drummer drummer Dave Lombardo. They are often credited as the fathers of crossover thrash, and that's because they started out very punk music, and then they got in the metal, and then they kind of eventually went back toward a punk shift, back toward that punk sound. So they've kind of been back and forth between metal and punk, which is which is thrash. They've released 12 studio albums. They achieved success with their debut 1983 self-titled album, which featured this very song institutionalized and it was actually the first hardcore punk video to get heavy airplay on mtv so they had a little bit of a rough start as a band in that they were voted by flipside magazine as the worst band and biggest assholes in 1982 <laughs> yes specifically won the award for biggest assholes so but then in 1983 flipside made them the best new band which no uh, i guess would, makes side and you would think that you'd be able to in the 80s you could vote every year that the biggest assholes were the misfits like <laughs> yeah i know henry rollins to then gg allen who used to take a dump on stage and then yeah, I don't think like, much yeah the misfits that, but... you could pretty much vote them every year yeah so essentially flip side flipped and uh called them the best <laughs> band in 83 <laughs> something about the suicidal tendencies that it, you know you already touched on they were rumored uh, in the early days uh, the the original members were rumored to be involved with local gang scene in venice called Venice 13, which was a Mexican-American gang. They were rumored to be involved with them because of Mir's trademark blue bandana, the violence at their shows, and the fact that the bassist brother was actually a member, and they actually used to wear stuff that said V13 on it. I mean, they, they openly advertised. <laughs> How much more obvious can it get, then? This is why it's funny that they actually rumored in their bio, because like, no, no, it was actually pretty obvious um you know they came to their shows like they kind of represented them so um <laughs> so i mean for me suicidal tendencies the song I, that i know most jumps out to me is i saw your mommy which was <laughs> from that debut album and i saw your mommy sound like a very innocent song except if you knew the actual words to the chorus the the second part of that is i saw your mommy and your mommy's dead mm -hmm. and yeah. it goes into a great depiction of of her dying basically yes that's a good representation of what to expect when you hear suicidal tendencies music <laughs> it's, very... it's punk they like i don't know what they say like thrash stuff like that like that's all cool they they help if you think of punk from the 80s, Suicidal Tendencies is one of the people, one of the bands that you used to define punk in the 80s. Yeah, I mean, like, like they no. are, yeah, they definitely... They're, like, like raw, and punk. they don't have any... Yeah, there's no yeah. filtering, there's mm -hmm. no... It's a, it's a weird I, music. Like, if you've never... Suicidal Tendencies is on an island all by themselves. Oh, yeah, exactly. When you hear the music, you, there's no one that sounds like Suicidal Tendencies. No, there isn't, and you can't... There's no way yeah. to describe it, either. There's no, like... like you can't yeah, compare honestly, to another like, band. <laughs> when I... I became aware of suicidal tendencies because I was a little later after. I was just getting into like dead Kennedys and stuff like that. And someone uh, was like, you should check these guys out. And I was like, whoa, like that's to the extreme. You know? <laughs> oh. too deep. <laughs> the last thing I'm going to get into is I talked about the 34 other members of the band. Just to kind of jump through my notes. In 89, future Metallica bassist and future Black Label Society bassist Robert Trujillo in the mm -hmm. band and he was one of the reasons they transitioned from more punk to a more metal sound so like in 95 that version of them broke up and Trujillo went and joined Black Label Society and then Metallica Rocky George who was in the band at the time joined the band Fishbone who Jimmy De DeGrasso he joined MD45 and eventually took over in, in Megadeth and Mir would replace all of them in 96 with including the future drummer for Vince Sevenfold and Bad Religion, Brooks Wackerman. Even when the, the 34 members came and left, like they all went out and were highly successful in other punk and metal bands. 
Well, I you guess know? that's credit so, to Mir that he recognizes good talent and then also doesn't burn them out. My joke earlier about Sandoval being the safest he was in the episode at a suicidal tendency show. There was a good four years that they couldn't play in L.A. because they couldn't get insurance after 10 rows of seats were gripped out during one of their shows. <laughs> by fans their shows used to just be brutal because we started off in niagara falls i was <laughs> hoping that suicidal tendencies would rescue us from the canadians and they did they thoroughly come through and uh, i gotta say they are on an island of their own they have their own sound but if you are a punk fan of the 80s you love suicidal tendencies let's go over and talk about our final thoughts on this episode all right, guys, I'll kick off this week. I'm going to sum my review of this episode up in a single word. Meh, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> now on to you. <laughs> I mean, it was okay. It was Miami Vice episode. It's kind of like one of the throwaway ones we've had in earlier episodes, too. It's like they're doing something that they're not supposed to be doing. They're Vice, and so they're not doing something Vice. We have a poet. I, I don't know where this story came from, how this made the final cut of the, of the episodes to make it into this season. But it was still Vice. Big high life and, and big parties and di diplomats from other countries. Eh, it was all right. Melissa, what, what are your final thoughts? It was a waste of time. <laughs> 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 I do want to touch on, I think that this story comes from one of the ripped of headlines stories. Mm. I think that I, if I can recall correctly, mm. I think it has something to do with that, that there was some dignitary that was coming over and that he was getting protected by the U.S., but they mm -hmm. don't ever go in, like, they don't use, they're, obviously, there's no country that he's from, so that you can point to it. The and country go, of Central America, Melissa. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the country yes. of Central America. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Did, did, did someone murder a poet? No, but Is I think there was, like, a poet me? that was coming to testify or something like that. So, I don't know. I don't I mean, I don't know. Like, don't quote me on it. But I, I have a feeling, I have a feeling that that's one of those things. And you will see it a lot. I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of episodes coming up where there's like stuff that doesn't make any sense to why Miami Vice is doing it, but it's because it's oh, in the oh, headlines oh. or it's going around around the world or, you know, so they have to put their foot in it a little bit and go, <laughs> look, this is what would happen if Miami Vice was involved in it. <laughs> oh, oh. Somebody on the writers in either the writers or the somebody who makes some Miami Vice has a, an opinion on these countries. And they're putting it in the show for a reason to like shed light on these things that happen, you know, whatever. I mean, not, the episode's not terrible. It's just I don't care about him. <laughs> I didn't care. Like, I mean, I had, I cared about what was going to happen with that banana. But <laughs> now that that was solved, after it got eaten, I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> and that, I do that banana know, is going to haunt my dreams. <laughs> I do. I need to know. Actually, I need to know. If those were the underwear he came with or if those were put on him. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? Just pick a Central American country. How many Central American <laughs> countries had death squads at the time? Probably all of them. Or damn near all of them. Yeah, damn near all Panama, of them. Panama, Costa Rica. Like, uh, you can just pick just, any of them. Just Columbia. pick one. Just pick one. <laughs> I mean, this is, and they didn't even try. They just, just broadly, Central America. And let's cast a white guy as the main political activist. <laughs> um, yeah, that did bug me that he was a white guy with a very bad accent. Why? I'm sure there could have been someone who was... Louis Guzman was in the episode. He didn't even talk. <laughs> you had one there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know why the Vice Squad is protecting him. I, I don't know what poetry has to... Why people are so... How is this guy's poetry so good that, that the political people of this country, Central America, that they're going to try and kill him? Because apparently his poetry is, is going to bring down... The dictatorship i do uh, love when uh, these episodes the come up because that means that because you know myrie's got quite a hooker and drug problem and there's these this whole bunch of time where the hookers and drug dealers are like man it's like fucking christmas out here <laughs> there's nowhere to be found <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's no police no I'm, one's I'm stopping still, us yeah yeah i'm still reeling from the fact that no pirates are coming after sunny crockett from last week's episode now we've got this this must have been filmed out of sequencer or something like melissa said this must have been like pulled out of the headlines and so it was like inserted into the middle of the actual storyline that's the only thing i can think of uh, i'm kind of with you dom it was kind of uh I, I i did think that grandpa partying with at the suicidal tendency show was kind of funny kind of cool you know
know, I did appreciate suicidal tendencies mixed in there. I mean, especially with the other two being uh, very Canadian. And at the end of everything, Tubbs doesn't even get to nail the daughter. <laughs> well, that's going to do it on that bombshell. That's going to do it for us this week. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this episode. We are inching so close to the amazing finale of season two we have two more weeks to go and we're just going to put out there right now to just, just expect that after the end of season two we are going to be so shook we're going to have to take a week off <laughs> you are shook to your core all right it's going to be shook so bad it might even be two weeks <laughs> yeah exactly that's going to do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode be sure to check out the website go with the com. we would love 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 to hear from you please email the show go with the heat at gmail.com or you can get us on twitter facebook you can find all the ways to contact us on the website go with the heat.com that's going to do it for us this week and we'll see y'all next time Bye. 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 B